I'm going to start a new series today. A series I felt that was right for this time. And I do have to warn you that I am going to bring a strong word today. We're living in a post-Easter world that requires some strength to the sermon. Because we live a different life now. In fact, that's the title of the series, The Life I Now Live. And so I want to maybe set a scripture that's going to kind of be a little complex. I know how I'm going to do this, but plan on teaching you some things today across the globe. But to set the framework for what I want to teach, would you, while you stay standing, just grab your Bibles out to Hebrews. I want to preach it from a passage of scripture, Hebrews chapter 12, more specifically, a passage of scripture that is not often preached, or at least, in my opinion, not often enough. And I wanna go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. Check this out. It says, You have not come to a physical mountain, to a place of flaming fire, darkness, gloom, and whirlwind, as the Israelites did at Mount Sinai. For they heard an awesome trumpet blast and a voice so terrible that they begged God to stop speaking. They staggered back under God's command. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. Moses himself was so frightened at the sight that he said, I'm terrified and trembling. No, you have come to Mount Sion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in joyful gathering. You have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God Himself who is the judge over all things. You have come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven who have now been made perfect. You have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel. Be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. For if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, we will certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. And when God spoke from Mount Sinai, His voice shook the earth. But now He makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. And since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshipping Him with holy fear and awe for our God is a devouring fire. Yeah, that's a post-Easter scripture right there. I wanna kick off this series by speaking to you from a sermon I'm entitling today, Your Reverence is Revealing. Your Reverence is Revealing. Are you sure you're glad you came out to church two Sundays in a row, are you sure? All right. Well, as you ready your heart for the Word of God, would you find maybe three or four people around you that you would consider friends? If you don't have any friends, would you quickly make some friends? Give them a high five, a handshake, and then go ahead and take your seat. Go for it. Come on. Real quick, make a friend, make a new acquaintance, get to know somebody in the family of God. Go ahead and take your seat. Amen. So coming out of Easter... I feel a pastoral duty to shepherd well. Over the Easter weekend, we had hundreds of people all across the globe uh, make a decision to give their lives to Jesus, to follow Him, to make Him Lord, meaning that they started a brand new life. Yeah, can we congratulate everybody who made a decision last Sunday to follow Jesus? Congratulations, you have been born again. That means you're no longer just simply born of the flesh, but you have now been born of the Spirit, which also means you have new life. This is essentially what the Apostle Paul describes in his scripture that he writes in uh, Galatians 2.20. In Galatians 2.20, if you guys wanna put that up, he said, it's no longer I, I've been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, series title, 
I live in the flesh, even though I live by faith, sorry, even though I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The life I now live, this life I now live, this, what Paul is doing is he's making a very clear distinction between two lives. He's saying, I've, ha- I have, I've had a life pre-Christ. Now I got a life with Christ and the life I now live is lived different. There's some difference about this life. This new life that we live, I believe, re- requires some discipleship. And I wanna, I wanna spend the next few weeks being your pastoral guide to living by grace. And to do that, I wanna draw from a peculiar yet undeniably powerful passage here in Hebrews. A passage that we will dissect over this series, but also a passage that we will find calls us as Christians back to reverence and awe. And it's honestly, I gotta commend you, it is so smart of you to come out to church today. Because I'm gonna be setting a foundation that I believe is gonna be critical to the rest of this series. So well done, you. But let me ask, how did you feel when your new life began? Was it a big change? Was it distinct when that new life started? I'm specifically talking to parents who have kids now. I'm not talking, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about parenting. Like like your pre-kid life and your kid life. And everybody know what I'm talking, was it dramatic? It was for me. Everything changed. I remember before our firstborn was born, we, Kara and I, we would, we would go on evening sunset bike rides. Uh-huh, yeah. And we'd pack champagne sometimes, the wine in the evenings. We'd go for a bike ride. We'd sit by the sunset. And sometimes we'd just turn that into dinner, out. No plans, we'd just do it. Whatever came to mind, you wanna do that? We just lived, we just lived by our own will. Then kids came, changed everything. Literally changed Our schedules, it changed the way we approached every day. It changed our spending habits and our saving habits. Our spending changed so much that money wasn't about living, it was about surviving. But how many people know that when things are born, things change? So I'm wondering what's changed since you've been born again. That was a great segue and you didn't, give any clap, applause, credit, anything, (laughs) nothing, no, don't, give me a token, just worked all week on that. This is actually somewhat what we have in Hebrews, you see, the writer of Hebrews, who remains unknown, but not without speculation, by the way, speaks about a kingdom that cannot be shaken for the purpose of us knowing the kind of worship that is acceptable. Now, whatever you do when we talk about worship, don't fall into the mindset of a modern style worship that we do here on Sundays while we sing together, clap in unison. That is worship, by the way, but it's not exactly holistically what worship is that the writer of Hebrews is talking about. You see, to understand worship, we have to go back to the old system of worship, which was a worship done with sacrifice. In order to worship God, you had to bring a sacrifice. Something had to die, you had to shed blood, and that sacrifice was worship. However, what we see in the new covenant isn't that different, it's just an elevated worship. Well, what you're going to find in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, if you let me read it, it will actually reveal, verse 1, what worship is in the new covenant. It says, and so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. So you see that? I, I plead you to give your bodies to God Because of all he has done for you, let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. So what Paul is articulating is in the old system to worship God required a sacrifice under the new covenant post-Easter world, we are a living sacrifice. So everything we do in this body is worship to God. The way we live, the way we occupy ourselves, the way we live our life should be done in such a way to glorify God. That's worship. Are you still staying with me? So what the writer of Hebrews is essentially doing is they're framing up for us, the saints, how to be unshakable. 
How many people think that in the current climate with which we live in, to be unshakable would be useful? To, to, to navigate a world that is constantly shaking, to navigate some times that are constantly turbulent, for you to be steadfast, solid, rock solid, unshakable, I believe would be powerful in this post-Christian era. And what the writer of Hebrews does, he writes with this intent, but he does it by comparing and contrasting two mountains. Two mountains that he presents, but not only does the writer of Hebrews presents, we're gonna see this parallel and this contrast all the way through Scripture. As scripture does it, encapsulates what these two mountains represent, which is the old covenant and the new covenant. For instance, you have firstly Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. You might have heard of Mount Sinai in the Old Testament. Mount Sinai was the place where the people of God gathered as God met with Moses to distill the Ten Commandments. It's at Mount Sinai where God etched in stone the Ten Commandments and all its subsequent laws that ultimately produced a relationship with God between God and His people where they could live in such a way that they would remain in relationship. You see, it's a crazy setting. It was the setting of Mount Sinai where God came to Moses and said, hey, Moses, this is what I wanna do. I wanna make the Israelites my very own people. I wanna carve out of every nation in the earth my very own possession, my very own people. But for them to live in relationship with me, there's gonna have to be a set of rules and regulations by which they live by. He says to Moses, go and ask the people if they wanna do this. So Moses does it. He goes to the people and he says to the people, hey, this is what God wants to do. Uh, sounds pretty good because what comes with his power is pretty protection is provision, um, but to get that, we're gonna have to keep a, a set of laws. And the people say, all that you have said we can do, deals on. So we have this moment at Mount Sinai that quite frankly happens to be a terrifying moment because for, for this holy law to be established, Moses had to set a perimeter around the entire mountain where nothing could come in contact with the mountain. Anything or any person that would come in contact would die, and it was terrifying. I know it sounds exciting, but the people were terrified. They were absolutely terrified. In fact, it says it, check this out, in Exodus 19, verse 16, it says, on the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people up out of the camp to meet God and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled greatly. Next chapter, chapter 20, verse 18, it says, now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off and said, Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. The people were straight up freaked out. They were like, Moses, we like it when you speak because you're like a buffer between us and God. But don't let God speak. <laughs> we ain't trying to hear God. <laughs> so don't let God speak. We wanna hear you. Now for the old covenant system of commands to work, it had to be revered. The only way it was gonna work is if they, if they obeyed if they revered. So what you had with this, are you staying with me so far? Yeah. So what you had with this newly set up system of law, what coupled with it was a system of consequences. That if you did not obey the law, you would have to pay the consequences. And let me short circuit the sermon, it's death. Yeah. That was the penalty of not upholding the things that they said, all you have said we will do, if you don't do it, you die. And so what we find is that these consequences were there to produce a reverence for the law, but it didn't, it didn't, it, it turns out that consequences don't produce real reverence. 
Because if I give you a definition for reverence, you'll understand why. And maybe you could write this down in your sermon notes. Reverence is deep honor outwardly demonstrated. It's not the risk of consequences demonstrated. It's deep honor demonstrated. However, what we saw with Mount Sinai is a law that was established that produced ultimately a a law that wasn't revered. It was a law that was feared. Straight up feared. Anybody anybody know somebody superstitious? You know anybody in your world superstitious? Yeah, I used to work with a, I used to work with a guy. Uh, we, do, we did electrical work together, and he was so superstitious, this guy. Like, I'm talking like, like all the superstitions you can think of. He wouldn't even walk under a ladder, you know, and, and we're electricians, so we had a lot of ladders. <laughs> and I didn't even know this stuff existed, but one time we're walking, we're working in this, like, little really skinny alleyway, and there was no room but for the ladder to be almost upright, and I'm up the ladder, and there was something on the other side of the ladder where he wasn't that he needed to get, but he just, he had this moment where he's like, ah, ah, and he decided to walk around the whole building (laughs) instead of just walking straight under a ladder. He called it OCD. That's what he called it, obsessive, compulsive, just, um, I'm telling you, there's a lot of superstitions today being labeled OCD because it's based in a fear if I don't do that, something bad will happen. That was the system of Sinai. This was the system of law. It was a superstitious law that if I don't do something, something bad is certainly gonna take place. It was driven by fear, the consequences. That's the setting of Mount Sinai. Now let me contrast that with another mountain mentioned named Mount Zion. This is not a physical mountain, but the place of God's presence and the representation of the new covenant. The writer of Hebrews uses Mount Zion to describe the place that we now live as followers of Christ. We have essentially left Sinai in its atmosphere. I like that, atmosphere. Now we live in Sinai. Sinai is where we live post-Easter, post-resurrection because of what Christ has done and because we have received Christ, this life I now live is lived in Sinai. Zion. You know what I'm saying? What you've come to is you've come to the city of the living God because you're a new citizen, you're a citizen of heaven. You've come to the assembly of the firstborn children, that's you and I who now No matter when we come to Christ, we get the first birthright blessing. You have come to God himself, not an idol, not an image, not an outer court, but you get to come right into God's presence. You don't have to go to a priest who goes in there for you. You get to come right into yourself and commune with God. You have come to the spirits of the righteous ones now resurrected in heaven. This is the Old Testament saints who ran their race, who are now in Zion. You have come to Jesus the one who mediates the new covenant between God and his people. At Mount Sinai, the high priest would be the one to mediate the sacrifice. This is really cool because what they would do, the high priest, they had to to mediate the sacrifice. If you wanted to come and worship God, you wanted to atone for your sins, you had to bring a sacrifice, but the high priest had to mediate to make sure your sacrifice was acceptable. Because human nature, you want to bring like a weak, limp, you know, lamb that you weren't going to use anyway, a little busted up, broken, you know, runt of the litter that you couldn't get any money for at market, and you thought, oh, that's what I'll bring to God. I'll tie that. And, and you'd bring that, and they try to get away with it, but the priest was there to mediate it. They say, no, that's not acceptable because the requirement is a spotless firstborn lamb. That's, that's, that. So you had to have a lot. Okay, and so and it was costly, but that's what, the, that's what the priest did. They would mediate to make sure it was acceptable. Now, now, what we see with Jesus is he is mediating his own sacrifice. So he's not mediating a sacrifice to determine whether it's acceptable. He's mediating a sacrifice to ensure that it's applied, that you don't just leave the sacrifice on the altar, but you take the sacrifice and you apply it to your life. Because what good is a sacrifice not applied? What good would Easter and the crucifixion and resurrection if we walked the same way and there was no change to our life? And the, mm. 
He's mediating the application, not the acceptance. He is the accepted, perfect, pleasing sacrifice once and for all mankind. (laughs) Mount Sinai, these two mountains, Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. Mount Sinai with sacrifices. In fact, I love what the writer of Hebrews says. It says, the sacrifice is still speaking of Jesus. It's just, it's just cool. And all the Bible nerds in the place, you're gonna love this. I haven't had time to preach it, but maybe we'll do a little bonus track or something like that, but it's just so cool. Because it says the sprinkled blood of Jesus is speaking louder than the shed blood of Abel. Someone put that in a song, come on. <laughs> that's sick. You know, because you got Abel's blood that's screaming for vengeance, but you got Jesus' sprinkled blood that's speaking forgiveness and mercy. And it's just, it's just cool. Just really cool. No other way to say it's just really cool. You can preach on that. But Mount Sinai speaks of consequences. Mount Zion speaks of convictions. You've got to see the contrast. And this is what it looks like to live post-Easter. Mount Sinai is a new covenant that's no longer about consequences, but a covenant that's now carried in our convictions, a covenant that isn't carried or driven by fear of death any longer, but a, but a covenant that's carried or in reverence, that's carried with a fear of God, not a fear of death. Can I quickly talk to you about the fear of God for a moment? Because, can I, is that okay? Okay, sometimes I don't know if you think it's rhetorical. I'm, I'm legitimately asking you would, you, would you like to know about the fear of God? Because I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about the, being afraid of God. That's Sinai. At Sinai, they, they backed up when God spoke. They didn't draw near when God spoke. They backed up. And they said, no, 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 Moses, you speak. Don't let God speak. They were afraid of death. That's being afraid of God. Fear of the Lord is the ultimate way that a Christian can live a fulfilled life. It's through the fear of the Lord. Now, I'm not, I, 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 mean, I mean it in this way, and I want to make sure this gets into your spirit. I'm talking about the fear of God in the realm of convictions and reverence. If I can put it the simplest way, the fear of God is our new motivation as New Covenant Christians. The scary truth is, You can love God, but not fear him. I'm sure many Christians love God, no doubt. I love God. You're here because you love God. And there's so much to love about God. He's done a lot for us. I mean, you just think of all the things that God has done, the ways he's blessed you, the fact that he gave up his life so that you can live, so you get off scot-free. You don't have to pay for the sin. You don't have to pay for the penalty. He's given you grace. I love that about Jesus. I also love the community of faith that he's brought me to. I love the blessings that I get to enjoy every day. I love the wife that he's given me, the kids that he's given me. I love Jesus, but loving God is based on what he has done. Fearing God is about what you do. So I can love God, but the absence of the fear of God. (laughs) Paul says it this way. uh, Let me reread Galatians 2.20 for us, but I'm gonna give it some extra context if that's okay with you. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. Uh Uh-huh. It's no longer I who live, right? The Christ who lives in me, got it. The life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So what he's saying is now that I'm born again, Christ is living in me and things have changed, all right? I'm not living like I used to. Though I'm still living in the flesh because I feel like I'm still living in a, a Sinai world, I actually live it by faith because of what he did. I'm actually living in a Zion world. Are you with me? Now check out the next verse that isn't often preached in connection, but is arguably just as important. Verse 21, he says, I do not nullify the grace of God. 
For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. The New Living Translation puts it this way. It says, I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. Why would he write that? Well, because under New Covenant living, it's a very real possibility. It is a very real possibility that as a new covenant Christian being saved by grace through faith that you would go about your life nullifying grace. Is this a strong word? You still cool with it? You can still hang for a bit? It's going to get, it's going to get a little heavier, but don't worry, then it's going to get real light. And then you're going to almost end encouraged. But go with me on the journey. We could treat as meaningless the grace that saved us. I mean, let's think about it. Let's think about it like this. The law of Sinai, for the law to work, it required the strictest obedience to the law. It, 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 because it had consequences. Like if you didn't do exactly what it said down to the detail, the consequences were, were clear. But under grace, it actually removes consequences because now God gives us the ability to carry convictions. Okay, I don't want this to hurt your brain, but I want, I want you to process this as deeply as you possibly can so to understand that in the life I now live, when I fail to develop convictions is when I actually nullify or treat as meaningless the grace of God. I told you it's gonna get heavier. Let's think about it this way. Imagine if we still lived under the old covenant at Mount Sinai. Okay, put yourself in this world. In Mount Sinai world, there were some mandatory things that you had to do as an old covenant person. So first and foremost, let me just cherry pick a couple of them that would apply to today. There was a mandatory 21% tax on everything that you earned. 21%. Tenth of the tithe plus all the different offerings that came throughout the year added up to about 21% of your giving that wasn't suggested, it was required. You had audits on your personal finance and business that mandated that you gave 21% out of your finances to, uh, to, to Israel. Now, at the end of the day, it wasn't just that. You had to mandatory attendance at every single worship gathering. Like everyone. They would inspect the tents to make sure no one remained in the camp when they went out to worship the Lord. That means like there was a pastor that would come around your house on Sunday morning, just making sure that he's not still in your slippers and your nightgown, saying, oh, you're not coming to church today? Okay. That'll be one lamb, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, there was consequences, so it was mandated. Now, you think about what that looks like when everyone's giving to the, to, the, uh, to the priests and everyone is attending, that looks like reverence. That looks so reverent. 100% attendance, like all giving's taken care of, not financial problems. Like, wow, that looks reverent, but it's fake it appears reverent, but it's forced. Because if you don't do it, there were consequences. Now come back to new covenant living with grace at Mount Zion. God graciously allows us to be driven by conviction, not consequence, for the sake of real reverence. Jesus loves real stuff. Jesus loves real relationship. He loves real reverence. That's why he gives you a real decision. It's not a forced obedience, but because I genuinely am grateful for the grace that God showered on me, as a result in this life I now live, I'm gonna formulate some convictions. I'm gonna gather with the saints because I'm a part of the body of Christ. I'm gonna honor God with the tithe, the first tenth of my income because I recognize everything I have comes from Him. Even turning up to church on time is a matter of conviction even though it ain't convenient. However, in the, in the modern church, 
We have a, we have a problem. We, we, we have a problem. We, we, we're nullifying the grace of God with casual convictions. I warned you, I said it's gonna get heavier. But it's, you want it even more? Oh, some people are egging me on, like, <laughs> okay. The level of your reverence reveals the depth of your revelation of God's grace. Let me say that again. The level of your reverence reveals the depth of your revelation of God's grace. I remember coming under fire for a social media quote I put out. And when I say fire, there's a little bit of mild heat, you know, maybe one or two, one or two haters. Uh, but I like to dramatize things. Um, but this was, this was the quote I put on social media a couple years ago. Comfort is a cancer to Christianity causing casual convictions. Do you know that the comfort that we experience in our church settings lends towards a casual approach to the convictions around things of God? You know, because there's no one really opposing you coming to the house of God. We, we can treat it as casual. And we treat it as flippant. Like, like, like because... Like what's, what's tempting, even on a weekend, and obviously I ain't preaching to anybody right now because you came to church. So just breathe, all right? Some of you are holding your breath. Just breathe. It's not you, but some people. It's not you, but some people. You know, they look at a day like today where it's sunny and they say, well, we haven't had sun for a minute. And sun's nice. I need vitamin D. Actually, my whole family needs vitamin D. I think we're gonna worship God in the sun with vitamin D in our bodies. And get ready because there's been some sickness. And we... That's what I'm describing. We nullify the grace of God with weak, casual convictions. Something else I put on social media this week, I loved it, from the scholar Warren Wiersbe. I put out there a quote from him. The reason we don't think about heaven is we have it too good on earth. And that's not talking about thinking about heaven, like, you know, the pearly gates and the gold streets or whatever your image of heaven is where everyone's got little wings that they grow out of their back. I don't know what your image of heaven is. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about heaven's mandate. It's talking about heaven's commission. It's talking about living in this world, but with a purpose to populate heaven on earth. We don't think about it because life is so comfortable that we're consumed by it. <sighs> yeah. Can I be blunt with you? as if I haven't, <laughs> just refreshing for me to get permission. Every summer, we see a major slump in giving in our church. Every summer. We're doing it for 11 now. Every summer, the finance team freak out because, and, and, and it's taken me a while, but I figured it out. 11 years, I figured out that people go on vacation in summer. I know, I'm smart. I'm slow, but I'm steadfast. I realize everyone goes on summer vacation. And don't get me wrong, I love vacation. I'm all, I'm all for it. I am the biggest proponent of developing rhythms of rest and going on vacation. But what I realize is that Christians take their tithe with them. So it's not really a tithe, but a tip or an entrance fee to the club that you attend. And if I'm not attending, I'm not giving. That's consequential. That's old mindset. It's not a conviction that regardless of where I am, I'm giving my tent to God's house and I'm establishing it as a firm foundation that cannot be shaken no matter if I've got a down payment to make. You know, some people have got a, a deeper commitment and convi conviction to their bank that they ain't never met. You never met the bank manager, but you wouldn't miss a mortgage payment. Why? Because there's consequences with that. Sinai has the appearance of reverence. It looks like you are reverent with your mortgage payments because you are meticulous to make sure you make them because if you don't make them, there's consequences. But when it comes to God's house, which actually has blessed you and God has done so much for your family and all that the Lord is, it's so easy to get weak on that conviction because there ain't really any consequences from that. Welcome to post-Easter. 
while, while there's not necessarily, and I could go on and on about all the different ways that we skip out on blessing the Lord and developing consequences, we're ultimately nullifying grace. We're ultimately nullifying grace. Now, can I be very clear on something? And, and don't worry, this is going to be encouraging. This is where it gets more encouraging. Okay. While there may be no consequences in Zion, there most certainly are rewards for developing deep convictions. Can I reveal them to you today? You see, the writer of Hebrews, he, he comes in with some, well, it's a strong warning. Let's just say this. Verse 25, saying, be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. This is Jesus, by the way. But more, more than anything else, the sacrifice is still speaking, meaning God's gift of grace is not meant to be muted or ignored or used as an excuse not to live reverent in life. Now, how would I mute the voice of God? Like they did at Mount Sinai saying, we don't wanna hear God. You wouldn't think we would do that in a Zion setting. But what we're doing is by saying, oh no, uh, uh, grace of God, as an excuse not to have convicted lives. By saying, oh, it's by the grace of God. We, we're actually misappropriating grace. It's not grace that gets us out of doing things. It's by His grace that I go deeper into things. Are you with me? So when I use grace in the wrong context, I'm actually muting and not listening to the voice of the one whose sacrifice is still speaking. Okay, so he says, do not, do not close your ear. Do not refuse to listen to the one who's still speaking. Check it out. He goes on to explain. For if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, we will certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. When God spoke, to Mount, uh, when God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth. But now he makes another promise once again. I'm gonna shake not only the earth, I'm gonna shake the heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. There is a shaking coming. The Bible actually talks about it a lot if you read the Bible. You know, Jesus said that he's gonna separate the wheat from the chaff and the sheep from the goats. The Bible has this time and time again as a warning, as an, as an illustration to let you know there's a shaking coming. But what the writer of Hebrews does is say, hey, things are gonna be shaken. I'd say it's already here, by the way. But things are gonna be shaken. And when the shaking comes, unshakable things are gonna be shaken loose. But the unshakable things will be steadfast and will remain. Now, now I've got to help you out because my goal as a pastor, my job as a pastor is to make you unshakable. So when the shaking of life comes, that you don't get shaken like the things of the world, but you stand strong in your deep convictions and you are stable being anchored and steadfast and standing the time of opposition. And the truth of the matter is what creates an unshakable believer is a deep conviction. A conviction is like a root that the deeper your conviction, the stronger your root system into making sure that you are steadfast in the time of the storm. That when the storm is raging and when the world is shaking, that even though things are bending and cowering and buckling and losing their minds, you as a believer are steadfast because your convictions are so deep that they're drilled down, not into a shaky surface, not into the sand, but they're built upon the rock of Jesus Christ. Therefore, they're stable. Therefore, they're stable. And that's what, a, that's what a deep conviction does. It sets roots for your soul. Remember what reverence is. It's deep honor demonstrated. All right, so how, how do I demonstrate an internal conviction? Well, it's your reverence. Your reverence is what reveals your convictions to a world still stuck at Sinai. It's your, it's your reverence, the way that you live, your reverence for God's house through consistent, not periodic, consistent attendance to God's house shows a world, not that you're crazy, but that you're convicted. I mean, it might look crazy. Let's be honest. It might look crazy to a world 
where they're spending Sunday, a sunny Sunday, getting vitamin D, but you're indoors worshiping Jesus. It may seem crazy, but after a while, it, it, it looks con- convicted. Like, you must have a conviction about that. You mean there's no consequences? Like, you could choose not to go, but you choose to go? Like, it's a conviction? Huh, maybe I should go. Are, are you with me? Yeah. Oh, you, you, you take a tenth of your income and you give the first tenth of everything you make to the Lord in a Silicon Valley environment, in this economy? It looks crazy. But consistently, it's conviction. How can you do that? Because my faith isn't in an economy. My faith isn't in, a, in anything but the fact that my Lord has provided for me and I know that he keeps me and so I'm gonna honor him for what he's done. You know what weak giving preaching is? Weak giving preaching is, hey, you give to God and he'll bless you. That's weak giving preaching. It's poor giving preaching. There are blessings attached to giving, but if you're preaching about the blessing alone, you're missing the conviction and the reverence of saying, God has already blessed me, what he's already done. Let me honor God because that's a conviction in my life that when there's job loss or layoffs or economy downturns, when everyone else is freaking out, I'm steadfast because God's provided for me before. I've honored him with my tithe. He'll provide for me again. I'm unshakable. I'm unshakable. Your your reverence is what honors the Lord. Your reverence is revealing. And reverence is what reveals that you're built upon the rock that is unshakable. Where's my worship team? I'm gonna go way out of time if you don't come back and keep me accountable. I feel like a permission slip when they're not up here. I can keep preaching. Your reverence, your reverence is revealing. Your reverence is what reveals what your life is geared towards. Your reverence, your reverence, your, your reverence is your convictions on display. That's what reverence is. Reverence isn't a monk in a monastery, not speaking to somebody, not wanting to lift their voice because I'm reverent. Reverence isn't volume. Reverence is activity. Thank you, Vox Jen, leadership team. Just speak to the Jesus freaks for a moment. Because sometimes we misunderstand reverence as if reverence is silence or lack of passion. I'm, I'm reverent. That's not reverence. Reverence is activity. Reverence is identity. When you identify God. My wife's strong on this stuff, I'm telling you. She don't give my, my daughters a quarter. I'm telling you, she's like, if they even say OMG, she's like, no, we don't say that. You're gonna say, oh my God. No, because what you really mean is wow. It's not in the same category. Reserve, oh my God, for when you're standing before God in all his splendor, in heaven, with the angels, at the end of days. But the fact that you got a bonus in your paycheck, say wow. The fact that you saw something cool on Instagram, say, wow, not OMG. I love that because that's irreverence. He is holy. He is God. He is high above. He is far above. Let my language and my lifestyle match it with a reverence and a conviction so that everyone around me would know that I'm either crazy or I'm convicted. That I'm either crazy or I'm convicted. I don't live in Sinai anymore. I'm in Zion. And my reverence is revealing. This is what makes me unshakable. Because I've drilled down on some deep convictions. I've anchored myself in God's presence. I don't treat the grace of God as meaningless. I don't take it as a free ride and saying, wow, now I just get out of my debt. I get out of my sin. I don't have to pay the price for the penalty that was paid for me. Ooh, I'm just going to live my life the way I want. No, I take it as a high price that was paid for me. And I say, as a result of the price that you paid for me, watch me live my life in such a way that has a deep drilled down conviction. I am going to live a life that honors God, that models Christ, that actually has deeper convictions than the world could throw at me. I'm not going to let the Sinai 
life of consequences, be more convicted of the Zion life as the freedom of God's grace. 